Okay, it's finally back. So if you have been following my channel recently, then you have probably noticed that I made some very awesome scores with the RTX 3090 Kimping. I was the first ever to go beyond 2.9 GHz on the core. I got the rank 1 score in GPU Pi 1 billion twice, once at 2895 and once at 2.910, something like this. Now I lost the rank 1 score to the Greeks again, but the uh, test is uh, like rendered useless now on HW Pot. Now the important GPU Pi test is the 32-bit version of the test and in the newest version, so 3.3. So I will I want to try the card again in that test. It takes a little bit under two minutes at very high frequency. Then I got the rank one score in Paul Royal and in Five Strike Ultra. The Paul Royal score is still the rank one score in Free Mark Hall of Fame as well as on HW Bot at the time of making this video. The uh, Five Strike Ultra score is still the rank one score on 3D Mark Hall of Fame, but not on HW Bot. And that's because for some reason HW Bot allows users to manipulate the 3D settings of the 3D workload. So you can make the test kind of easier for the hardware. So you can affect level of detail settings that make the test easier. So that will, of course, raise the FPS or makes the FPS to go higher without touching the actual uh, clocks and you can even disable tessellation altogether if you are running an AMD card from the drivers. So it's technically cheating. So uh, I consider the Hall of Fame record as the real record but because that's run with proper like full settings without any cheats applied. So the Paul Royal is still the rank one score and the Five Strike Ultra rank 1 score is still the rank 1 on Hall of Fame. But what happened with the card was that when I was uh, when I finished that session, when I made the uh, GPU Pi 2.91, Paul Royal 18.496 and the rank 1 score in Five Strike Ultra, when I was about to run again the next day, like at the very late of December, like 28th of December, something happened when I uh, shut down the machine. So I, I was in Windows 10, I was checking that things are all right to run again. Paul Royal was working, all of the tests were working. The temperature delta between the pot and the uh, GPU was absolutely awesome. When I shut down the machine in order to check Windows 7 that it's fine to go, because it was the operating system for GPU Pi, for some reason the graphics card didn't turn on anymore. So the all of the other parts in the system were booting, but the graphics card didn't give GPU voltage anymore. So the GPU voltage was always zero. I cleaned the graphics card properly, I tried different slots on the motherboard, different power supply, it was definitely the graphics card. And I noticed when I cleaned the graphics card that one of the phases over here, so on the right hand side of the graphics card, PCB, uh, was darkened. So uh, there had to be some heat issue related to the VRM during my like real LN2 sessions. And I will explain more now. And there's still some darkening on the chokes as well. It's hard to show on camera like this, but I might show an image later if it's not good enough. There's still some darkening on the chokes at the center. I'm not fully sure if that's uh, the end result of like burning Vaseline or rust or some dirt, not sure, but the damaged MOSFET was somewhere around here. So what happened, what I did was that when I uh, was certain that the graphics card is not functional anymore, I sent the graphics card back to Kimpin in Taiwan to check the graphics card or to inspect the graphics card and do possible repairs and the GPU was still fine. So uh, yes, there was some damage on uh, the VRMs, so the graphics card had gone into some protection mode to protect the GPU from possible like short circuit. So the MOSFETs should be now replaced and we have to test the card out. So the, the, the graphics card you see in front of the camera right now is the same card I used for the records. Same PCB, same memory chips, the same GPU, only the MOSFETs have been replaced and now I really want to share my like T3 
tips and experiences with a card on LN2, which you should follow if you purchase this card and you plan to try it on LN2. So uh, some, of you some of you guys requested to show the graphics cards PCB in close detail, so here it is. But Buildzoid will be doing a very in-depth PCB and VRM analysis of this, of this graphics card model, so I will leave the most dirty work for him because he knows a lot more about VRMs and PCB designs than me. But so yeah, so the graphics card has 23 power phases. There are 13 power phases on this side of uh, on this part of the graphics card, so 13 over here. There's 9 over here and then there's one power phase over there. I'm not fully sure what this is all about. Is it uh, like a memory power phase or MSVVD, MSVDD power phase, I'm not fully sure. There are 12 memory chips on this side of the graphics card and there's another 12 on the back side of the graphics card. This, the back side of the GPU is filled with those small caps and maybe the most, in, the most interesting parts of the graphics card's design are the OLED display which connects over here. So this is the connector for the OLED display. The uh, uh, Probit voltage measurement points over here are labeled at the back side of the PCB as well. So you can see every second pin is a ground pin, as I said. GPU, ground, memory, ground, PEX voltage, ground, 1.8 volts, ground and MSVDD. MSVDD is like an efficiency voltage. It doesn't affect stability like uh, on its own. It only uh, you need to raise it in order to maintain the uh, real performance of the card. So if you don't raise MSVDD, the performance will be bad even if your clocks on paper are high. There are some dip switches at the back. Those are some tiny like offsets for the uh, important voltages, but you don't really have to touch those. You can do all the necessary things with the classified software and the Precision X1. So you don't have to touch these tip switches, but they are there if you wanted to try them. Three 8-pin power connectors, as we already checked. EV bot connector and 4-pin fan header. The uh, nice, nice thing about this 4-pin fan header is that if you attach or if you connect a fan to this port over here, you can actually control the speed of that fan with Precision X1 software. So that's, that's actually quite good. So the uh, PCB is definitely good. The memory on this card is absolutely insane, but the issue is that it doesn't like too cold temperatures. So uh, the memory on this card can really go high, but uh, it suddenly goes bad after like minus 90 or minus 120. So uh, I'm absolutely sure that for the final best clocks you need the GPU Inferno which has this big thermal pad over here. So this is, the G this is the Inferno backplate, but for the graphics card processing unit. So uh, I made the holes on the backplate myself, and there's this, uh, bleak, there's this big blue uh, thermal pad between the backplate and the card. You can get these big uh, thermal pads from AliExpress, for example. They don't cost anything re really. But I'm absolutely sure you need the Inferno backplate for the final best clocks to maintain good clocks on the memory. And when I was, I, I spent like three days just testing different mounts with the card. And it really seems so that you can get the best possible mount when you use a backplate. You can get nice even pressure when you use a backplate. The thermal based spread will be like very centered on the GPU itself. So that's a very good uh, sign if the best thermal based spread is directly at the center of the GPU. When I was doing just a uh, finger tight for the record scores and so on, the thermal based spread was always kind of uneven. Sometimes like one part or one side of the GPU, sometimes one corner, then uh, like uh, it wasn't really perfect. So uh, I think you can get the best result with a backplate and just get just get the Inferno if you want to maintain the high memory clocks because that it seems so that the memory doesn't really like too cold temperatures. 
I tried both KPX and the pink thermal paste from Thermal Grizzly and both of them are very good if you ask me. I was able to do 2700 plus with both of the thermal pastes, so they are very good, both of them I mean. And uh, the tricky part is, so uh, what happened is that uh, I made a mistake with the heatsink design and it really happens over here. So uh, there are two different heatsinks, so one, the large one is over here and the smaller one is over here. The tricky part is that there's a thermal pad between uh, the uh, MOSFETs and the heatsink, but there's actually, they use very thick thermal paste between the chokes and the heatsink, and that's the mistake I made. So the thermal interface material actually looks like thermal pad when you uh, receive it. So here's some of that thermal interface material uh, applied on the heatsink. So uh, it obviously tears into pieces when you uh, attach or when you disassemble the cooling solution. And what I did was that I used a thermal pad between the chokes and the heat sinks. And that causes an issue because over here on this side of the graphics card, if you use a thermal pad, it actually, uh, because this space is actually very tight, the space between the chokes and the heat sink, it causes the, it causes kind of bad contact now between the MOSFETs and the heat sinks if you use a thermal pad. So you cannot use anything too thick between the chokes and the heat sinks. So there was probably a little bit bad contact on some of the MOSFETs at the center and they, that caused them to overheat too much and that caused the damage on the card. So uh, do not swap the uh, bad looking gunk on the chokes to any thermal pad if you get this graphics card and you want to run the card on LN2. It's most important to have very good heat dissipation on the MOSFETs because they heat up the most. The chokes themselves, they don't really heat up that much. So you need to have a very good contact on the actual MOSFETs themselves and you need to use a very strong fan attached to the uh, uh, heatsink assembly. I don't use the stock one EVGA provides, I use a delta fan and you could all you could also use like another delta fan on the back side of the card so behind this part of the graphics card to have proper heat dissipation at you know, at the most important part of the VRM area so it's the same so uh, they actually use this kind of thermal interface material between uh, the uh, chokes and the heat sink so this is some chinese ztech electronic materials the thermal conductivity is actually quite good for a thermal interface material like this, so 5 watts per meter Kelvin. It's hard to apply, it's very hard to apply. I already tried some over here, so I will just do that off camera and uh, I will uh, assemble the heat sinks on the card. I will put the uh, uh, memory heat sink and I will attach the AIO cooler onto the GPU again and let's see if the graphics card actually runs. And then we can obviously try how well the card overclocks now with thermal paste swapped because the stock thermal paste they use is not KPX, it's not very good. So it's the same, but those are the steps. So definitely follow my advice and my tips if you get this card and you want to try it on LN2. On air or water cooling, it doesn't really matter if you use a very thin thermal pad over here because you will have adequate amount of heat dissipation for that purpose from the MOSFETs, but it's best to, it, it's best to stick with the uh, thermal interface material they provide because the uh, gap is very small. It's kind of sad, I hoped they uh, made the heatsink a little bit better so that you could use like a thermal pad between the chokes, as between the chokes and the heatsink as well. Now uh, this is the modification I made the uh, heatsink. So you can see I cut the little extension part over here because I wanted to make it lower so that I could use some insulation on the graphics card container. It's necessary, you need to uh, drill or saw this part of the uh, heatsink if you want to use even one layer of three millimeters thick closed cell foam insulation tape on the Tech9 Icon. I'm using the original Tech9 Icon, not the improved or not the updated version Kimpin has now released and he also has the mini icon. I'm using the very original one and it's, it's very very good GPU container, I really like it. But to use any kind of insulation you need to cut this part from the heatsink. It's kind of sad but you have to do it. 
so now I will just apply the thermal interface material, check that, it, that uh, there's ample amount of it and the contact is good and uh, yeah I will uh, get back to you once the card is ready to go or, and installed on my test bench. So these are the steps and yeah, so let's, let's get going. And now the moment of truth. Yay! Let's see. EE. Seven, eh? Last time it was stuck at 97. Boom, V2. Woo! So it runs. So let's try something like Paul Royal. And now running the latest version of Paul Royal. Around 60 FPS. And here's the system. A look at that. <laughs> Boys never grow old. Yeah. So uh, definitely awesome. So this kind of proves that EVGA warranty is damn amazing. So uh, if you have any problems with the item you have purchased, you can easily contact EVGA straight and get some possible help uh, with the uh, uh, product that has uh, problems. So, uh, and you can return the item straight to EVGA. You don't have to return it to the store. So I'm definitely happy. So uh, I hope this gave some info, uh, information for you guys. So uh, definitely watch uh, Build Soids in depth, PCB and VRM analysis once it's out. And yeah, give a thumbs up if you like to see this uh, video and subscribe to my channel and other than that thanks for watching one of my videos once again and i will see you on the next one